Franz Peter Schubert was a composer whose music could be as tender as a lullaby. Through the night, my songs entreating gently bleed with ease. As thrilling as a national anthem. Or as happy as your favorite game. Franz was born in 1797 in this house, on the outskirts of Vienna in Austria. He was the fourth of five children born to a poor schoolmaster and his wife. Franz's father taught his pupils in his own home. In those days, there were no public schools. Father Schubert's salary came from his students' parents who each paid a small sum of money. A schoolmaster's pay did not amount to very much. Little Franz, along with the other pupils, was taught to read and write in his father's school. As was the custom of that day, all children were taught to read music. Franz learned his music as well as his other lessons very easily. Franz was given lessons on both the violin and piano by his older brother Ignaz. Soon Ignaz had to admit that his little brother could play both instruments better than he. In fact, he played the violin so well that he was often called upon to play that instrument in church. The local choir master began giving singing lessons to Franz. Franz had a beautiful voice. The choir master was an excellent teacher. He taught him singing, piano, and organ, and young Franz learned quickly. The choir master was often heard to say, whenever I want to teach that boy something new, I find he knows it already. Because of his musical brilliance, Franz, at the age of 11, was invited to take an examination to enter the convict. The convict was a famous Vienna school, open to a carefully chosen group of boys. In exchange for singing in the Empress Choir, they earned their room and board and their education, including musical training. This choir performed both at the Royal Palace and the Court Church. Franz was one of several boys taking the examination. While he waited his turn to sing, some other boys, better dressed than he, laughed and jeered at his faded blue smock. They told him he looked like the son of a miller and asked him why he was there. But they soon stopped laughing when they heard his clear, beautiful singing voice, and they were amazed how quickly and easily he answered the musical test questions. Franz was one of three boys accepted to study at the convict and to sing in the imperial choir. Franz lived at the convict for four years, and during that time he suffered many hardships. Because Austria was at war most of this time, food and supplies were scarce. There were only two meals served daily at the school, and they were meager and poor. Franz had no money to buy so much as an apple to satisfy his hunger. In winter, the dismal, poorly lighted rooms were extremely cold. But in spite of his physical suffering, Franz was not unhappy. In the midst of his noisy fellow students, he sat at his little table composing sheet after sheet of music. Paper was scarce, so he used any that he could find. He rarely used a piano as he composed, but sometimes he would tap on the table with his fingers as though trying a certain part. This string quartet in B-flat major was one of those early works. One day, an older student came into the room where Franz was trying his compositions on the piano. He had learned of Franz's great interest in composing and furnished the boy with music paper for the rest of his school days. Franz was made the leading violinist in the school orchestra and sometimes acted as the director. His teachers all recognized his musical abilities and some said that Franz Schubert already knew more about music than they could teach him. Franz was allowed to go to the home of the Empress Court musician, a famous composer of that day, to take lessons in composition. Because of his musical ability, he had been excused from the strict rule that no student could leave the school alone.
Like most people of Vienna, Franz enjoyed watching the Emperor's Imperial Guard on parade. Perhaps his recollection of this impressive scene gave him the inspiration to write his famous Marche Militaire years later. Franz often spent Sunday afternoons at home with his family. In the courtyard in back of their home, he, his father, and two brothers would play string quartets composed by Franz while at school. During his last year at school, Franz composed his first symphony to celebrate the principal's birthday. This symphony was one of 21 brilliant works which he composed during that year. At 17, Franz Schubert began teaching in his father's school. His father had insisted that Franz, like his older brothers, earn a living by becoming a schoolmaster. Franz disliked teaching because it took too much time away from his music. However, he still found time to compose over 300 works, including 150 songs. One of these songs, called The Earl King, is perhaps his most famous. Schubert's friends began to gather in the evenings to hear him play his compositions. Among them were former classmates, other musicians, artists, actors, poets, and writers. As the years passed, this group of talented people increased in number, and they became known as the Schubertians. They were drawn together because of their great admiration for Franz Schubert and his music. When Schubert was 19, he left his father's home. He had decided to give up teaching. He wanted to earn a living as a composer. For the remainder of his life, he lived with first one friend and then another. During these years, Schubert met one of the most famous German singers of the time, Johann Michael Vogel. Vogel was deeply impressed with Schubert's songs and in the years following sang them again and again in the homes of wealthy Austrians. As a result, Schubert and his music became well known throughout Austria and Germany. Schubert devoted all of his time to music which seemed to pour out of him. When one piece was done, he began another. Much of the music ended up in drawers and cupboards to be found and published long after his death. He was now 21 years old with no steady income. He had the good fortune to find a position as music teacher to the children of Count Esterhazy. Count Esterhazy was a nobleman whose lands and home were in Hungary. At first, Schubert was very happy with the beautiful woods and rolling hills of the country. However, after a few months, he longed for Vienna and his large circle of friends, so he returned to the city. The following year, he took a trip into Upper Austria with his friend Fogel. The lovely scenery and the pleasure he derived from fishing in the mountain streams may have inspired him to write his famous trout quintet. During the same year, one of Schubert's operas was performed in a Vienna theater. When the audience applauded and called for the composer, Schubert refused to go on stage because he did not own proper clothes for the occasion. Schubert wrote several operas, and though much of the music was beautiful, the operas received few performances because the stories were generally unsuitable. Even today, his operas are not well known. When Schubert 
When Schubert was 25, he composed his best-known instrumental work, the Unfinished Symphony. This symphony has only two movements, while the usual symphony has four. It was composed as a gift to the town of Graz, which had elected him an honorary member of its musical society. Schubert never heard the symphony played by an orchestra. This most loved and famous of Schubert's orchestral works was first performed 37 years after his death. For some time, Schubert had been in failing health, and early in his 26th year, his illness reached a serious stage. He was placed in a hospital where he spent weeks in recovery. But illness did not keep Schubert from composing more and more musical works. The next year, in early summer, he was again engaged by the Esterhazy family and accompanied them to one of their summer homes. He spent six months with them. The peacefulness of country life and the sunshine and fresh air helped to restore Schubert to better health. Back in Vienna, at a meeting of the Schubertians, an artist wanted to draw Schubert's portrait. But Schubert was too restless to sit still. Someone gave him a book of Shakespeare's plays, and he became so interested in one of the songs in a play that he proceeded to set it to music. While he composed, the artist drew his portrait. The beautiful song Schubert composed was Hawk, Hawk, the Lark. Schubert wrote other songs using words from plays by Shakespeare. One of them is the famous song, Who is Sylvia? Schubert's songs were often sung at social gatherings or in concert halls. He wrote more than 600 of them. They are called Lieder, a term that means songs rich and melodic with words that tell a story. Among Schubert's songs is the beautiful composition called The Wanderer. This song expresses the feelings of a man longing to be back home as he wanders from place to place. The Wanderer is typical of the sadness, beauty, and excitement of Schubert's music. From distant mountains I have come The vale in thought The ocean foam The ocean foam in March of 1828, Schubert presented a concert devoted entirely to his own music. Most of the performers were his close friends. The hall was filled with an enthusiastic audience and the concert was a great success. One of the numbers on the program was the now famous song called Serenade. Schubert wrote this song as a present for a young lady he admired. He was too poor to buy her a gift. So In a short while, Schubert's health began to fail again. He went to the home of his brother Ferdinand, who lived in the suburb of Vienna. There in November of 1828, at the age of 31 years, he died. In his short life, Franz Peter Schubert gave the world more than 1,000 musical works. Unfortunately, the people of Schubert's day never heard many of his compositions, since they were not found until after his death. But the recognition that Schubert failed to receive while he was living is now given to him by thousands of admirers. Schubert loved people and gave to them the only thing he had in life, his music. Music as tender as a lullaby, as thrilling as a national anthem, as happy as your favorite game.
Johannes Brahms. Johannes Brahms was a fine musician with many talents. He was a brilliant pianist, and a fine conductor of symphony orchestras. But above all, he was a truly great composer, whose one standard for himself was that his work be as perfect as he could make it. He wrote many kinds of music, some simple and tender, some dramatic and complicated. Johannes Brahms was born in 1833 in a slum area of Hamburg, Germany. He spent his childhood in a neighborhood of dark, old, dirty houses. The only place for him to play was a narrow, crooked street. When Johannes was about six years old, his father discovered that the boy had a good ear for music. To teach Johannes the notes of the scale, his father played the notes on the piano. Johannes could name them all without even looking at the piano. Johannes' father began to give Johannes violin lessons when the boy was only six. Brahms' father earned his living by playing the violin and several other instruments in cafes and at dances. He thought Johannes might do the same when he grew up. Johannes began to take piano lessons from Otto Kossel not long after he started school. This teacher soon recognized the boy's talent and felt that he could become a great pianist. But Johannes soon began to show more interest in composing than in playing the piano. He papered the walls of his room with music he composed, but it was not good enough to satisfy the high standards he set for himself. He usually tore it down burned it, and started all over again. Johannes loved to play with tin soldiers as a change from his work with music. He arranged them over and over in different formations. This interest in changing patterns led him, later, to repeat groups of musical notes in different formations in his musical compositions. At 10, Johannes appeared in his first concert, which was arranged by his parents and his teacher. Johannes played so well that Otto Kossel was able to persuade the best music teacher in Hamburg, Edward Markson, to take Johannes as a pupil in both piano and composition. Markson did more than continue Johannes' musical training. From his library, he loaned the boy books on literature, science and painting. Johannes developed a love for books and a respect for knowledge that remained with him throughout his life. When he was 13, Johannes went to work with his father playing dance music in cafes near the docks in Hamburg. The Brahms family was poor and Johannes had to help earn the family's income. The long hours of work and study were very bad for his health. Fortunately, Johannes was able to spend a couple of summers in the country on a farm that belonged to a friend of his father. The fresh air and peaceful surroundings completely restored his health, and he had more time to work at his music. 
Johannes also conducted the male choir in the local village and wrote compositions for the choir members to sing. Later, he asked them to destroy these works because he felt they were not as good as he wanted them to be. Brahms first became known to the public as a pianist. He gave several concerts in Hamburg, playing some of his own works as well as those of other composers. But concerts took too much time from his composing, and Brahms now was sure that he wanted to devote his life to composing. From the time that he was 18, Brahms wrote music of such high quality that it satisfied even his most severe critic, himself. His training as a pianist made him especially good at writing music for the piano and songs for voice and piano. One of the still famous pieces he composed at this time was the beautiful song Liebestreu. In 1853, Brahms and the Hungarian violinist Eduard Remenyi played concerts in the homes of wealthy music lovers around the country. Brahms learned to love the gay gypsy music he heard in their travels. He arranged some of these gypsy tunes into his famous Hungarian dances. One of the highlights of the trip occurred when Remenyi introduced Brahms to Josef Joachim, conductor and violinist at the court of Hanover. Joachim and Brahms became good friends. Joachim used his influence to arrange important concerts, which helped make Brahms and his music better known. Brahms decided to take a walking tour along the Rhine River as a short vacation. Joachim had given him letters of introduction to musical people who lived in towns along the way. At Dusseldorf, Johannes planned to call on the composer Robert Schumann. Brahms played his piano sonata in F minor for Clara and Robert Schumann. Schumann was greatly impressed and whispered to his wife, here, my dear Clara, you hear music such as you have never heard before. Johannes was still a playful boy at heart, for all his great genius. He delighted the Schumann children with daring acrobatics and always found time to play with them. Brahms and the Schumanns soon became close friends. A short time later, in Hanover, Brahms and his friend Joachim were delighted to read an article about Brahms that Schumann wrote for a leading music journal. Schumann praised Brahms' genius and brought Brahms' work to the attention of the musical world. When Brahms was 20, his first works were published. Schumann had persuaded a publisher to print Johannes's compositions. Brahms was now well on the way to becoming famous. The next year, Brahms returned to the Schumann home in Dusseldorf. Robert Schumann was seriously ill in the hospital, and Brahms knew that Clara and her children would need help. Brahms looked after the Schumann children and gave piano lessons to help support the family. Clara, a brilliant concert pianist herself, was away much of the time on concert tours, which helped pay the family's expenses. Brahms, too, was forced to return to the concert stage for the extra money it would bring him. After Robert Schumann died in 1856, Brahms continued to help provide for the Schumann family. When Brahms was 24, he accepted an appointment from the Prince of Detmold, Germany. For three years, Brahms directed the court choir 
was soloist for the court orchestra, and gave piano lessons to members of the royal family. He was busy only in winter, so he had much time to compose. It was here that he finished his piano concerto in D minor. When the D minor concerto was performed in Leipzig, only two or three people even tried to applaud. The rest of the audience hissed the work. It was the only time in his life that Brahms experienced such a musical defeat. Greater appreciation for Brahms' work was shown by the members of a ladies' choir, which Brahms directed the following summer. When Brahms left, the ladies presented him with a silver inkstand to show how much they had enjoyed working with him. Brahms began to spend more and more time in Vienna, Austria. Here he could meet and talk with other musicians and artists and enjoy the strong coffee he loved to drink. Vienna gradually became Brahms' home base, especially after he was made director of the Vienna Choral Society in 1863. Walking was one of Brahms' favorite pastimes. In Baden-Baden, where he spent many summers, or in town, he would get up before dawn and stroll through the woods or parks. Often he was able to work out ideas for his compositions on these walks. Brahms spent long evenings discussing music with friends at the summer cottage Clara Schumann had bought near Baden-Baden. Out of these happy months, came some of Brahms' finest musical works, such as this sonata for cello and piano. Not all Brahms' music was born of happy times. Years after the death of his friend Robert Schumann, Brahms still felt a deep sense of loss. The death of Brahms' mother saddened him still further. Yet these unhappy events inspired Brahms to write the German Requiem, one of his greatest and most famous works. Brahms himself conducted the second performance of the Requiem at the Bremen Cathedral on Good Friday in 1868. While the first performance in Vienna had not been well received, the public praised this second performance highly. When Brahms was about 45, he grew a beard while he was away on vacation. When he returned and went to his favorite cafe, he played a joke on some of his friends by pretending to be a choir master from a nearby town. It was some time before his friends realized who he was. When the University of Breslau offered Brahms an honorary degree, he wrote his thanks on a postcard. A friend told Brahms his thanks were expected to be in the form of a musical composition, so Brahms wrote a gay piece for orchestra based on student songs, calling it the Academic Festival Overture. In 1889, the mayor of Brahms' native city of Hamburg presented him with another award. This recognition from the town where he was born meant more to him than the many honors he received from European rulers, governments, and universities. On March 7, 1897, when he was 64, Brahms attended a performance of his fourth symphony in Vienna. After each of the four movements, the applause was so great 
that Brahms had to take a bow. This was one of his last appearances in public because Brahms' health was failing. Friends took Brahms for drives in the park when he became too ill to walk. But even the warm spring air did not help his condition, and he died on April 3, 1897. Not only famous musicians and artists, but friends and humble people from all walks of life came to honor Brahms at his funeral. Johannes Brahms was one of the greatest composers of all time. His striving for perfection set an example for all who followed after him. So long as music is played, his unforgettable works are sure to be included. As the beautiful Danube River wends its way through Austria, it flows by Vienna, one of the gayest, most carefree cities in all the world. And what's kept it that way for so long? Well, for one thing, music. Vienna has for centuries been proud of its musical tradition and has encouraged music and musicians almost since the very beginning of its long history. Composers like Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven and Brahms and a host of others have happily left their own cities to live in Vienna. And wherever you find music, of course you usually find the dance. While the forerunner of the waltz was danced differently from the way the waltz itself was danced later on, dancing to waltz music became a Viennese way of life from the moment the waltz was invented. The first waltzes were played at Vienna's imperial court balls, about the same time, the early colonists were settling America. But it wasn't for another 150 years or so that the first of a long line of waltz kings came along to make Vienna the undisputed waltz capital of the world. The very first of these waltz kings was Josef Lanner. The leader of a popular Viennese dance orchestra, he was also a better-than-average composer. One night, he led his group through one of his latest compositions. It proved so interesting that the dancers stopped dancing and for the first time just simply listened to the music. The success of this new concert waltz inspired Lana to compose more of the same type of music. Before long, his waltzes were the talk of the town. Soon, Lana found that he needed help in order to provide enough waltzes for the music-hungry public. He called on one of his violinists who had considerable talent as a composer. The violinist was Johann Strauss, a man who Lanner never guessed would one day replace him as Vienna's waltz king. But replace him he did. When Lanner tried one night to pass off Johann's waltzes as his own, Strauss resigned and took most of Lanner's orchestra with him. Now, armed at last with his own orchestra, Strauss threw the narrow, unimaginative traditions of dance music to the winds began to compose a host of beautiful waltzes with startling new forms and designs, and soon became Vienna's new waltz king. Eventually, however, the strain of all work and no play took its toll, leaving him almost exhausted and with little time for anything but his work. One day, in an effort to do something for his family, Papa Strauss arranged piano lessons for his sons, Johann Jr., whom the family called Shani, and his younger brother, Yosef. Why piano lessons? Why not the violin? 
Papa Strauss made it very clear that evening as he talked to his wife. A little piano was a harmless thing, certainly. But no violin lessons to tempt them to stand before an orchestra night after night as I must do, leading the most wretched of all possible lives. And for what? Fame? Position? Power? No, Anna. One miserable musician in this family is quite enough. No sons of mine shall ever follow in my footsteps. So the boys had to be contented with the piano. Although Shani would have given anything in the world for lessons on the violin, he wanted to become as accomplished a violinist as his father, whom he admired with all his heart. One afternoon, in the midst of piano practice, Shani's fingers began roaming over the keyboard in search of a waltz he had heard his father composing earlier that day. But no, this melody was not one of Papa's. Instead, it was an original, a little waltz of his own. The six-year-old entitled it First Thoughts, and here's how it sounded. As the months drifted by, it became obvious that all the piano lessons in the world could not hope to satisfy young Shani Strauss. He wanted to play the violin and would not be happy until he possessed a fiddle of his own. Finally, the day arrived. On his eighth birthday, at a time when his father was out of town, his mother presented him with a little half-sized violin. For the next two years, Shani struggled to teach himself what he could of the instrument. But because he had to keep the violin a secret from his father, and could practice only when Papa Strauss was not at home, his progress was painfully slow. Finally, the lad managed somehow to pay for professional violin lessons. And his teacher? None other than Herr Amann his father's retired concertmaster. One day, as Shani finished his lesson, he turned suddenly to the old musician and asked, Herr Amen, will I ever... I mean, do you think someday I might be able to play like my father? Like your father? Yes, Shani, I, I think you will play like your father. And, and perhaps... perhaps even better. Even better, Herr Amen? Let us instead say differently. For you see, my boy, you have something he, he never had. Call it a kind of sweetness. Oh, your, your father bewitches his public like a magician, true enough, and, and you'll do the same, but... But you'll also make them weep, Shani. Yes, weep for joy, for love, for longing. Oh, how I'd love to do that. But Papa has made up his mind against my ever becoming a musician. Nonsense. Who really can prevent you from becoming a musician, eh? Do what you want to do in this life, my boy. And watch your father grow proud of you. But pride in his son's musical accomplishments was the last thing on Papa Strauss's mind when... One day, several months later, he heard some most excellent violin music coming from elsewhere in the Strauss apartment. Interested, he decided to track down the sound to its source. And there was Shani, playing in the same style as the elder Strauss, tossing his body to and fro, just as he had seen his famous father do at concerts and dances. What are you doing? What are you doing? And who taught you to play the violin? Herr Amen, if, if you please, Papa, you know you're always... Yes, 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 I know him, of course I know him. But with what do you pay him? With, with the money I make giving piano lessons. I teach some of the children in the neighborhood. Oh, some of the children in the neighborhood, is it? 
Well, my good man, I suggest you tell them to look for other places to spend their money. Because from now on, this fiddle stays under lock and key. Despite his father, however, Shani secretly bought another violin, went on with his lessons, and even began the study of harmony and musical composition. A few years later, he felt he was ready to take the giant step he had dreamed of for so long. The organization of his own professional dance orchestra. The 18-year-old musician, now sporting a jaunty mustache, rehearsed and rehearsed the little group for months, and at last felt ready to put his talents to the final test, his first public concert. After weeks of patient search, Shawnee somehow managed to rent Domeyer's Garden Restaurant, one of Vienna's finest dance halls. The concert was so well advertised that the place was soon completely sold out. And small wonder, after all, wasn't the event to feature the talents of a young man apparently determined to set himself up as a rival to his famous father? And meanwhile, what of the famous father himself? Needless to say, he had a few opinions of his own. Young upstart. Going to try to outdo me at my own game, is he? Ha. <laughs> well, he and his concert will fail as miserably as Napoleon at the gates of Moscow. But the famous father was wrong. For immediately after Shani's orchestra finished the concert, the crowd gave its young leader the wildest ovation in Viennese musical history. Undoubtedly, some of their enthusiasm was stirred by the fine tribute Shani had paid his father early in the program by including one of Papa Strauss's most popular waltzes. But certainly, most of the applause was for Shani himself. And so, a new star was born. A star whose radiance during the next half century was to explode far beyond Vienna into every corner of the entire musical world. Part of that world was conquered almost overnight as word of Vienna's young waltz king flashed across Europe like a skyrocket. So busy was the excited chatter that one could have easily thought it responsible for inspiring one of Shani's most popular early works, the Trish Tratch, or Tok Tok Polka. By the 1860s, the music of Shawnee Strauss had broadened and deepened to a point where his now famous creations in waltz tempo began to take on true symphonic proportions. The most famous of his works in this new style captured the image of one of Europe's greatest natural wonders, the beautiful Blue Danube. A year later, he was inspired to compose a waltz honoring another of his city's beloved attractions. The lovely Tales from the Vienna Woods. Shawnee's brother Joseph was a trusted member of the Strauss organization, along with Edward, the family's youngest son. Joseph specialized in composition, while Eddie concentrated on conducting. In 1874, now wealthy and famous beyond his wildest dreams, 
Shawnee succeeded in accomplishing a task he had for many years thought impossible. The composition of a magnificent work for the stage. Entitled Deflator Mouse, or The Bat, the opera score proved to be what many consider the composer's finest achievement. Ten years later, Shani at last succeeded in producing a second operatic masterpiece, The Gypsy Baron. was cheered longer and more loudly than anything the waltz wizard had ever given to Vienna. Finally, toward the close of the 19th century, he was inspired to compose his most symphonic work in three-quarter time the masterful Emperor Waltz. With it, he joined all Vienna in paying special tribute to his country's esteemed monarch, the Emperor Franz Josef, who in 1888 celebrated his 40th anniversary as crowned head of the Austrian Empire. Eleven years later, the Viennese paid tribute of a different kind. For June the 3rd, 1899, saw the passing of their most revered musical spokesman. One who had managed even more profoundly than his famous father before him to charm and dazzle and bewitch this most musical of cities as no man had done before or has done since. Today, in Vienna, this statue keeps alive the memory of Johann Shawnee Strauss, violinist, conductor, composer, beloved master of the dance, and the world's wonderful wizard of the waltz. <laughs> 